Very nice, very nice. I think that was an attempt to throw me off my game. <laughs> but I've come focused to talk about this person right here, Dr. Carl Villamoria, the 52nd president of the Association for Academic Surgery, and he's been a great leader over the year. And so when we talk about Carl Villamoria, we are here to ask the important question. Who is Carl Villamoria? And I'm here to help fill in some of those question marks. First of all, he is the John B. Murphy Endowed Professor, Vice President of the Quality of the whole Northwestern Medical Health System, which is amazing, as well as serving as Vice Chair of Quality uh, for the Department of Surgery. He's the Director of the Surgical Outcomes and Quality Improvement Center. Just, it goes on, the whole Illinois Surgical Quality Improvement Collaborative, a faculty scholar for the American College of Surgeons, and a past president of the Surgical Outcomes Club quite an established record. He has done the following. He has cut his research um, teeth uh, looking at national trends in the management of cancer patients uh, using quality indicators. Um, many of you remember a few years ago the just incredible talk he gave here at the Academic Surgical Congress in Jacksonville about the first trial, which was not necessarily to argue for less hours, but how to use the hours that they do have better in a more flexible way. He has then moved on logically to look at surgeon wellness and burnout, something he's going to talk a little bit about later, which is now leading to the second trial. Um, most recently, he's also written about rating the Raider systems and making sure that that's fair. And mo he's very proud of his statewide coordination of quality improvement uh, for surgical care. He is a colleague who gives us all incredible imposter syndrome. Um, his number of publications is incredible, 348 peer-reviewed publications. That continues to go up hourly, much like our national debt. Um, so it's probably up to 350 now, and uh, he's published in journals like New England Journal of Medicine, Annals of Surgery, JNCI, you see the rest, 162 invited lectures, and he's been funded by the NIH, the American Board of Surgery, the American College of Surgeons, as well as the uh, statewide Blue Cross and Blue Shield. In addition to this, and more importantly, Carl has mentored countless accomplished stars in academic surgery. Um, I just found out recently that he won a very prestigious mentoring award at Northwestern University uh, School of Medicine, and uh, it is a very prestigious award. I want to give Carl a hand on that. In fact, Carl's unique hands-on style of mentoring uh, has become the inspiration for a motivational poster. And if you can't read this in back, it says, sometimes you need to break people down to foster new growth. So keep up the great work, Carl. But to get a deep dive into what has made him this great doctor, we have to take it to the beginning. Carl was born in Munster, Indiana, uh, to Yaz and Feroza, who sit up here in the front. Uh, his father was a material science engineer and worked in research and development. His mother uh, took care of the kids, uh, but also uh, ran the family computer business. He grew up a happy child, as you see here, plentiful with hair, as many people have asked about. Uh, what happens there, we'll talk about a little later. But even at a young age, Carl contemplated the problems with surgical training, as you can see in this thoughtful repose. Carl also dreamed about wearing flowers around his neck and golden wings. Oh, there we go. Check. So from this point, let's look at the development of Carl Billamoria. He was an undergraduate at Northwestern, and he studied molecular and cell biology. He went on to, uh, I heard, uh, train at the NIH for a year before going to Indiana University School of Medicine, where he um, finished not only AOA, but he was A-OK. -okay. <laughs> he did his general surgery uh, residency at Northwestern and then did a research fellowship at Northwestern as well as the American College of Surgeons. Carl really represented this new generation of research fellows who were studying outcomes in health services research. Many don't know this, but ironically, one of his mentors told him not to pursue this line of research because he was certain to fail. Oh, if we could all fail so well. 
And then he went on to do a surgical oncology fellowship at MD Anderson. He would come back uh, to Northwestern, and you can see here his deep devotion to Northwestern where he's been uh, this entire time. One might say that he has a great deal of purple loyalty. One might say he bleeds purple. And so this year with you, President Bill Amore, it's been fantastic. It's been great to get to know you, your guidance, and your vision for, st for the strategic plan. But I couldn't figure out this, this love of purple and I had to go to some of his old friends. And it turns out that his nickname is Prince, not because of royalty, but because of the rock singer Prince. And here Carl is with his doppelganger Prince. And they assured me that he very much looked like Prince. And this really came out during his college years. And it was in the college years that he had this transformation to becoming this rock legend of Prince. And it may not be completely obvious to you, this, this, this similarity in look. Um, so I had to use our special AES intelligence services to unearth hidden pictures to help me see this resemblance. And very few people know about the AES intelligence services. That's why it's an intelligence service. But um, here's a picture of Prince here. And then they found this picture. I'm not sure I see it, but uh, I think we have a few more examples. Here's one of uh, either Prince or Carl, and then here's another picture here. Um, I think this was a picture of Prince at uh, Disneyland. And then this is a picture from the American Music Association in 2015. It's unclear whether this is Prince or if this is Carl. Uh, so, But it makes you ask the question, Carl is a tremendous dancer, but who does it better? Mm. I'm going to have to give the, uh, the, the nod to Carl on this one. It's, his flow is much more smooth and natural. But I think Carl will be the first to tell you that overall, nothing's more important than family. And his wife Sheila's here with their kids. Nia, Layla, and Beckham, all watching along with great interest. Um, his siblings who couldn't be here, uh, uh, Zal and uh, Nina, uh, they are twins. And you can see a picture of all the family down in the lower left. If you go to some of these na international meetings, you'll always see Carl and the entire family. And it just tells you the devotion he has to his family and making sure that they're all together. And one thing Carl will pass on is this great uh, love of dance. And the kids are incredibly talented, as you can see. We're just going to wait for my favorite part here. Oh, this is it. Yeah. And so it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our president of the AES. Wait for it. Carl Bill Moya. Thank you. Here you go. Uh, thank you, Eugene. That was very nice. Um, no thanks to my wife for torching me. That Prince thing, I knew. My high school friends are terrible. The Prince thing has plagued me since kindergarten. So, all right. Anyway, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, start um, and spend a little bit of time talking about what the AAS has been working on. In 2014, under the leadership of President Tim Pollack, we, we embarked on our first strategic planning approach. And he really led that, and it really laid out a great plan for us for the next five years. And it, and it turned out we achieved most of what was on that plan. 
And so we, uh, we then, in 2019, uh, this past year, got together. We did more than just go to a baseball game and drink beer, but we worked hard to come up with another strategic plan and spent two days in a conference room doing this and really thought a lot about what we need to achieve our mission, which is to inspire and develop young academic surgeons. And these are our values, and we do the, this inspiration through this, uh, these values. And we, just to be brief, there's a huge strategic plan, where it's on the website, um, but we wanted to focus on three areas. Certainly organizational sustainability, value, diversity and inclusion uh, is a new area that we wanted to focus on. And I won't go through the whole thing, but I want to point out a couple things. Um, one of the nice things about the AAS is that we're very transparent. We have elections onto committees. Uh, we seek out the opinion of the current committee chairs to understand who's doing a good job and who we want to promote. So there's a little inside baseball secret. If you get on an AAS committee, uh, you should work hard, get engaged, be activated, and then you will get promoted. That's how we, that's how we work through this. And so, um, and if you haven't been on an AAS committee and you've been trying, please email me, even today, and we have other ways to get you involved, um, and, and we can do that this week. You'll see here at the meeting, we're establishing some new revenue partnerships. We've changed our conflict of interest uh, policies to be able to do that, and that was a, something I really wanted to focus on. Um, and so, you know, the, the robotic skills tournament, if you haven't tested it out and gotten the time, get on the leaderboard there. Let's see if you can do it. Uh, and there'll be a competition tonight for that. Our goal number two was to maximize the value to the membership. So we want to figure out ways to continue to advance and transform this amazing meeting. We've done so many things over the years. We'll partner with our SUS colleagues, of course, in doing this. And then we continue to hear from our members that they want more ways to connect with each other. And so we're going to work on that, as well as bring the AAS to other meetings. We'll have AAS at SSO, where we might have a social hour, or do a mentoring session at SBAS, something like that. We have a number of ways that we want to expand career development as well. This year we're going to focus on actually conveying mentorship and sponsorship skills to our membership so they can continue to do it better. The AAS is particularly poised to create opportunities for young academic surgeons. That's what we do. Where else can you be a committee chair in a major organization when you're only a few years out of training? That's the opportunities that we have here and we want to continue to expand those for our membership. We also want to focus on global fellowship opportunities. You'll see AAS members all over the world under the leadership of Sandeep Kaswani. We continue to expand that reach, and uh, those are great opportunities for our members and for the folks that we reach uh, in other countries. So we want to continue doing that. And as we started to do this morning with Dr. Cosgrove, we want to think about fostering other academic phenotypes. It's not just about the K to R transition and making sure that works. We want to help people on whatever they're working on and however they want to be an academic surgeon. And so one of the things we're working on is how to become health system leaders. And then we have an increasing number of surgeons who are doing that. So we have four great uh, health system leaders who are here this afternoon. They flew in just to do this. So please come back to this room by 1 p.m. so we can hear about them. And I think they're going to surprise you with some of the things they say, uh, and some of the surprises they've had in their careers. And finally, with diversity and inclusion uh, being such a, a, an important principle, we've formalized this now. There's a community uh, head, headed by Calicia Clark uh, that is going to look at our entire uh, association, figure out where we have disparities, make sure everything that we do mirrors our population. Uh, you might see a, a session here where there are two male moderators and another where there are two female moderators, but we want to make sure as a whole when we look at the entire moderator slate for this meeting that we are representing our population. Same for people who teach in our courses and lead our committees and our officers. Um, and we'll continue to find ways to engage more and more uh, underrepresented minorities. So I want to take a minute, and it's frequently said here that we stand on the shoulders of giants, and I've been fortunate to be at a number of great institutions that have looked out for me and been mentored by dozens of great people. I'll touch on a couple of them here. Um, I was fortunate to go to Indiana University, uh, actually very fortunate, similar to Dr. Cosgrove, it was the only medical school that took me. And uh, so I was mentored by four tremendous surgeons, many surgeons, but these four really stood out and really um, showed me that I could fit in in surgery and uh, made me love surgery, and so I owe a, a tremendous amount to them. 
When I wanted to do outcomes research, uh, there wasn't a place for it, and uh, Mark Talamante listened to me very carefully, and when others were saying, go do basic science, he listened and said, well, why don't we talk to Winchester over at the college? And uh, luckily, the college is directly across the street from Northwestern, and uh, Winchester was immediately uh, supportive of the idea of having a resident at the college doing research, and Tom Russell, same thing. He had actually had this vision. He thought that surgeons should come to the college and do research and work on the programs of the college in that building. And so through their work and the support of Dave Hoyt, uh, who's been an incredible mentor and friend, uh, we have now had 15 years of the ACS Clinical Scholars Program and trained more than 30 residents in that line of work. And so uh, it's something I'm proud of, but couldn't have done without tremendous support from these folks. Uh, it's always a sense of uh, a, a source of pride being part of the MD Anderson Mafia. Again, a group that really looked out for me and uh, f fostered my particular interests. Um, I was a resident at Northwestern. Um, Nat Soper and Dave Mavi were incredible mentors while I was a resident, but that was just the beginning. When they recruited me back as faculty, that's when it, I think a lot of my development with them really started. They saw the vision for creating a research center, and they gave me the time and space and money to really do it. And they have protected me. They've given me tough love when I've needed it. Um, and I, don't, I, if, I know many of you know Nat, but he's a very special individual, and uh, I couldn't have asked for a better chair as a resident and as a faculty member. Uh, uh, I, I gotta move on, otherwise I'll get a John Boehner moment here, okay. So, uh, so and then we've had other, I've had other sponsors throughout, career, uh, throughout my career that have been really important to me and have set up a number of opportunities for me, and they're, they're great friends as well. And then through the AAS, we meet a ton of great people. And at a time when I said, I don't really know if I want to be a leader in a national organization, I, just, I was doing other stuff. I was busy in my research. Justin and Caprice really pulled me out and said, no, we, we think you should try this. Um, and I really value their friendship and support. And I hope that I've achieved what you thought we could do uh, uh, when you were thinking about that. The AAS is a ton of fun. We've been on multiple continents together. We've been in O'Hare Hiltons and O'Hare airports. Uh, and then nothing brings you closer together than getting your inseam measured in Thailand with a bunch of friends in public, so. <laughs> <laughs> and this is <clears throat> an incredible group of officers that I've had the opportunity to serve with. Uh, they're, they're, they're bright, they're energetic, they're charming. Um, and I feel very, very confident leaving you in their very, very capable hands. <laughs> and so. <laughs> I told you I'd never use that picture, Carrie, but sorry, yeah. All right, uh, the BSC staff, thank you so much for everything you guys do. It's a tremendous, uh, uh, we couldn't do any of the stuff that we've done over the last 15 years without you. Uh, you guys set up the meeting and everything we do and are always there whenever we have a new idea to help us push forward with it. Now I wanna recognize Christina. Uh, Christina has been our executive director for 14 years. She's been to every academic surgical congress except the one where she was on maternity leave. And now she is uh, going to step up in the organization and uh, will be leaving us as ex executive director, but she won't be far. JJ is gonna take over, but Christina, could you stand up? We need to recognize you for 14 years of incredible work. Uh, so this is our research team, and uh, you know it started you know with one or two folks about uh, eight years ago, and we've grown to more than 50 now. And I don't say it enough, but this is the group that makes work fun. I like coming to work because of this team, and uh, you know as uh, Dr. Longacre said yesterday, you know. I found a group of people who are all smarter than me and uh, we make each other better and the work we do I think is phenomenal but the people are excellent and so uh, uh, I really appreciate you. There was some mention of me getting a tattoo with so quick on it, I did not do that but I did put on my license plate and that, I was told that was going too far. So, uh, My parents are here, uh, they will tell you that I was a late bloomer and I, uh, <laughs> Totally disregarded my studies. You know, their, their accent isn't quite that bad, but it's funnier if I do it that way. And so, uh, but they really pushed me. I was not interested in schoolwork, and they deserve a, all the credit for really getting me to where I am. Um, and they claim they never pushed me to become a physician, but I have some evidence to the contrary, <laughs> and I thank you for pushing me. I, this is the perfect job for me. I couldn't do anything else. 
Uh, my family has been incredibly supportive the whole time. These are my children. Uh, yes, even the two on the right, genetics are amazing. They did get whiter as they came out. Um, and so we have, we have some white on brown crime in our house, but it's uh, usually okay. Uh, but they are incredibly funny and charming, and I love watching their antics, and there's nobody I'd rather travel the world with, uh, except for my wife, Sheila. And Sheila is the one that holds us together. She hates the fact that she's on the screen right now. She does not like the attention, but she's usually got children draped all over her. She pulls us all together. Occasionally, she gets out for a crazy night uh, there in the bottom. And I saw this quote uh, that Catherine Velopoulos put on Facebook recently, just because someone carries it well does not mean it isn't heavy, and she carries it well and makes it look really easy but she keeps us together, we lead a charmed life. And as I mentioned, she will probably break out the running man tonight, she does get crazy. So that's, I knew you would give Eugene that Prince picture. I totally, I saw it was moved in the house and I knew that it had been used, so. Okay, all right, so I wanna talk a little bit about uh, fanning the burnout fire. I wanna talk about how we continue to develop excellent academic surgeons in this era where there's a new focus and an important focus on well-being. I want to talk a little bit about how I got into this, being a quality and safety researcher, and how our team has moved into this. I want to talk a little bit about how our generational misperceptions and how our lack of adapting to changes in healthcare have really added to the problem, and so have our good intentions at times. So all of this is pretty important for how to train your millennial. This is mostly for Beckham. He's got to be interested in something during the talk. So. All right, so uh, well, first thing is, how do we define the problem? Is burnout an issue with our trainees? We've seen wide estimates from 12% to 75% of our, tra our trainees experiencing burnout. And so we've been lucky enough to partner with the American Board of Surgery to do the AppSite survey. Uh, the residents fill out this survey afterward. We really appreciate it. This year was not all of us. There were other groups using the website survey, so we had the really short part at the end. Uh, but the, the response rate is always excellent, so we can really get a picture of what's going on. Uh, we can analyze the results. We then interview program directors, faculty, residents across the country to try to understand those results a little better, and then we investigate new topics. And the resident voice has really changed how, what research we focus on, and I think it's really changed policy for residents. And so four years ago, I did present the results here of the first trial, just to remind you, because I'm gonna sort of talk about how this led into the new work. Uh, we tested two different duty hour policies at 117 programs across the country. Uh, we waived limits on shift lengths and time off between shifts in the flexible arm um, so that they, residents could stay and do great cases and take care of sick patients and not leave in the middle of an operation. Um, all the things that you know, they wanted to do. And, one of our fellows looked at this recently and looked at whether things were staying okay over four years of flexibility. You can imagine that over time under flexible policies, things could get worse, residents could get really uh, uh, tired of it. Uh, but what we found was kind of interesting. We, the residents were reporting well-being was getting worse irrespective of study arm. And so we wanted to, of course, understand that a little bit better. And so we then brought it back into the next year survey. And this was recently published a couple months ago by uh, one of our uh, re research residents at Northwestern, and Yaron Hu, who's the pediatric surgeon at Northwestern. And they really started to get at the, a real rate of burnout. And you can define this many different ways. But about 38% of our residents were experiencing weekly burnout symptoms. 12 and a half were thinking about leaving their program and 4.5 had suicidal thoughts. And that's considerably higher than the baseline suicidal thoughts rate um, in an age mash population. And so this is clearly a problem. We also saw that as your burnout score increased, as did your likelihood of having thoughts of leaving uh, the program, and suicidal rates, you can see they're shot up quite, a, or suicidal thoughts shot up quite a bit. So clearly, the uh, first takeaway here is that burnout is a problem, and it's associated with adverse resident outcomes. What leads to burnout? I think we all know some of these things, but we adapted a model from Tate Shanafelt. He had this for practicing physicians. We wanted to do this for residents, and all of these things probably make sense to you. Having control and flexibility and autonomy and camaraderie and faculty engagement is really important. But the world has changed. Residency is different now, and it's through no fault of our residents. Um, but we probably have not adapted fast enough, and a lot of these things affect burnout. So there's an increased workload. You know, the, the, we have sicker patients in the hospital than we did 20 years ago. Large, uh, larger ser service censuses. Uh, there's been work compression. Length of stay is shorter. We gotta get more stuff during, done while they're in the hospital. And just like the attendings are affected by documentation requirements, so are the residents. 30% of their time in some cases is spent on documentation. 
Autonomy is clearly a huge part of burnout. Everybody wants autonomy in their work, but regulations have changed how things happen, and you know, the VA is a very different system and where we frequently had a lot of autonomy as trainees. And so RVU compensation has also changed that. Intendings are you know, encouraged to churn cases and residents get to do less because of that. There are also challenges with camaraderie. It's not like it used to be where we had a lot of time maybe to sit around and have lunch. We took out the inefficiencies from training. Um, and some of that was good with duty hours. We, we took away the dead time. Um, our residents, we hear at many programs, these larger programs are covering 10 to 12 hospitals. They never see each other, it's kind of lonely. And the same thing with the apprenticeships. It's a great way to train residents. They like the training that they get, but again, it's kind of a lonely existence when you're not part of a team. And the bottom picture there is our, one of our resident team rooms and uh, there was nobody in it when I kind of just went in randomly to take a picture and, and the donuts weren't even eaten. So, you know, they weren't getting there. That's like a surgical aphorism gone wrong. Feeling appreciated is very important to all of us. And I think the residents these days have a little less exposure. We've heard this from the residents. They've told us this through the, the interviews and I think we all know this. Um, my focus is on getting home to the family at the end of the day and maybe I don't take the residents out as much as I should or go to that evening journal club. Um, when I go up to round, I round with the nurse practitioner instead of the residents because they're off doing things and the nurse practitioner's on the floor and we've lost our touch points with our residents. There's also less money in medicine and we took, one of the first things we did was take away the social events and the things that built team and camaraderie and appreciation for our residents. But luckily this wellness issue coming to light is starting to change that. And uh, hopefully um, if they'll have it, the residents are welcome to our house every year and that's, that's them in our yard there. So, uh, but that was us focusing back on, on thinking about how we start to just in the smallest way start to show appreciation. Mistreatment is a new thing. We've started to have increasing diversity in surgery, which is great. Gender diversity, socioeconomic diversity, uh, racial ethnic diversity, but that introduces new problems. And we saw in the New England paper that that added to some of the issues. Um, I know everybody's looking at the uh, sexual harassment icon. They have a number of them. I was told not to uh, use that one, so I won't. <laughs> that, that was picked by two women on my team. I'll just, just to protect myself from some sort of Twitter annihilation. Okay, uh, so takeaway number two. So some of the great aspects of residency have changed and we probably haven't adapted fast enough. But our goal is still the same. We want to train great residents. And so our team's approach to that has been to develop the second trial. We had a first trial, we have to have a second trial. So we started this in November, 215 surgical residency programs enrolled in this trial, where we are seeking to reduce the rate of burnout, improve resident well-being while ensuring excellent educational outcomes for residents and patient outcomes. So what we're doing is taking our QI principles, our performance improvement principles that our team is so well versed with from all the other work that we've done, we're applying that to this wellness issue. And so this is an example. We're taking the data from the survey, we're aggregating it up to the program level with lots of you know, protections in place to protect resident anonymity, and we're providing it back to programs so they can see how they're doing on burnout and uh, suicidal thoughts and resident camaraderie, all those details, sexual harassment. And then they can take that data and if they have an opportunity for improvement, they can look to our toolkit. And this toolkit's been created by looking into the literature, best practices, and then our team has gone around the country touring programs who are doing this really well and taking those lessons and putting it into a catalog. So you can search in this uh, intervention uh, wellness toolkit that went live just this past Friday and it shows what other programs have done. And so thank you to many of you in the room who have contributed and spent time with our team. I think this will be just an advancement for the field of surgery. So the second trial is working to improve trainee burnout and well-being uh, through QI principles. But as I started to look at this, I was a little worried about the reports. Now this is a great report. This program, it's all green. That means all the residents think everything's fine. Uh, all, they're in the top quartile compared to all the other programs in the country. But there were ones where that wasn't the case. There were some programs that were really struggling and the residents were struggling. And then, you know, we heard a lot through our interviews and going to programs, giving grand rounds about this topic. I've been spending a lot of time with residents and our team has as well. Um, they've been all over the country. Uh, I don't usually go, but they're kind enough to Photoshop me into this picture to make sure I'm, I'm there. But uh, uh, one thing we've all started to understand is that some of the misconceptions that we have may be adding to the problem. So take a pause before you blast me on Twitter, hear me out, okay? So some of the misconceptions are, it's the millennials, right? They're terrible, they're lazy, they just want time off. They don't, they don't, they don't want to, uh, they don't know how good they have it. 
So the millennial sits squarely between Gen X and the next generation, which is called iGen or Generation Z. The millennials are just starting to become attendings, but they're still mostly in, in the trainee realm. So who are they? They're the me, me, me generation, right? They're taking selfies, uh, focused on themselves, and this was the Time Magazine cover in 2013. But you go back into 13 years before that, and they had a very similar cover, right? 20-something, laid out, uh, late blooming, or just lost. Sort of similar, right? And then you go back another 13 years, and it's the me, right? So this is starting to repeat itself. So is it possible that it's not just the millennials, but this is just a recurring theme that each generation has faced? Here are some insights about millennials. The children now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders. They contradict their parents and tyrannize their teachers from 2,500 years ago. Okay. <laughs> this is not a new problem. The next, you know, the generations are always worried about the next. Here, there is a camp of people who are continually pushing for more time off and less time in the hospital. People who come into surgery with unrealistic expectations about what the job actually requires. This was a chair of surgery? No, it was a chief resident. So even this generational shift happens within the time of being in residency, right? So now, uh, Dr. Cameron probably even worried about some of his trainees and whether they would amount to anything. Oh, come on, a little laughter would be helpful. <laughs> That might have just been, I have no evidence for this. He has not told me this. I was just thinking of giants who succeeded. It might have been a bad joke that just cost me my career in American surgery. So, okay. So number four, each generation has worried about the work ethic and self-centeredness of the next. Now, no matter your opinion of the millennials, there's a book to support it. Uh, you can get fired up about gaslighting or coddling, whatever it is. But let's look at the data. And this HBR piece uh, concluded, generational differences at work are small, thinking they're big affects our behavior. And they leaned heavily on this paper from the Journal of Business Psychology. This was a mental analysis, tens of thousands of workers. And they did things, and you can see in the bottom there, they compared boomers to X, boomers to millennials, X to millennials. And they found that there really weren't that many differences with respect to job satisfaction, commitment, and turnover, how often they wanted to change jobs, something we think that the millennials do a ton. Turns out it's not true. The average lifespan is actually pretty similar uh, over the generations. And they concluded that meaningful differences among generations probably do not exist. And the differences that appear to exist are likely attributable to other factors than generational membership. Other factors. So let me give you an example. So we think that millennials are always on their cell phone, right? Their head is always there. They get hit by cars walking across the street because they're in their phones. But it's not that it's just them. It's all sorts of people. It's the old people in the room. It's me, it's you, it's Justin Dimmick on his phone over here. No, he doesn't actually have one, but. Anyway, uh, societal changes actually affect us more and may be more influ influential than generational membership. So some other misperceptions. They are lazy and just want more time off. Now we all have our stories about this, right? Um, but we might be misunderstanding them. I had a resident who wanted me to round earlier on a Saturday because he had to get to his marathon training run, was pressuring me to round earlier. I had a resident tell me that the rotation was going really well because her hours are really great. And uh, another resident who uh, said that uh, she needed to forego seeing the last couple patients of clinic because her hip hop dance class was about to start. Now you will see later tonight that I should have probably gone with her uh, <laughs> for the little lesson. But, or actually you just saw actually in Eugene. Good job. Uh, but they, I think they may be showing us something. They're showing us something about balance, and we just have to help them figure out that balance. These people are strong. They are not lazy. They are not weak. They did a lot to get into medical school. Medical school admissions are in a sharp uptick uh, over the last 20 years, and you have to be really good. At Northwestern, you have to be in the 98th percentile and have a mean GPA of 3.9 to get in. In the country, it's the 85th percentile on the MCAT. Um, this is one of the most interesting pieces of the first trial, in my opinion, and I want to walk you through this. What we did was we asked residents, if you could go back and pick a residency program, what kind would you pick? Would you pick one that had flexible hours where you may have to work a little bit more? Or do you want the standard policies where you're a little more protected? And the dark blue shows that they prefer flexibility. The light blue is that they were neutral. And you can see there's a pretty strong preference for flexibility and, 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 and neutral there. And if they experienced flexible policies, they were even more positive about it, so they saw the benefits. And then over time, as they got older in their residency, that increases with PGY a year, their, their positivity for flexibility got even more. So they understood the benefits of having flexible duty hours and, uh, and that professionalism that came with it. So our residents are willing to work. They're willing to do this. We shouldn't say that they're not. They are. They showed us that. They also showed us that in this. 
So a number of residents said the flexible arm did lead to some less time for health, rest, and family and friends, which is understandable. They might not have made it to the evening events with their kids because they were allowed to work a little longer and stay with those sick patients. But when we asked them about their well-being, particularly after the intern year, their well-being was better in the flexible arm. And we interviewed them about this. We asked them about this. And they told us that they were willing to make the trade-off. Of course I'm willing to stay. This is my job. I'm a professional. And we all do this too, right? We might not make every soccer game or we don't make it to the gym one day because we were doing something with our patients. And our residents are willing to do this. So they are not weak or lazy. Now, uh, there's also this sense that they're entitled and coddled, right? We've heard this. If you give a mouse a cookie, they're going to want a glass of milk. If we indulge them in well-being, they're going to ask for even more stuff, and that's going to be terrible, and they're going to complain about small things. Well, that's not entirely true. But let me give you an example where residents or, or trainees or learners sort of uh, noted an issue, and that has led to other problems with burnout. So. Medical students, uh, when we were interviewing uh, residents, they told us that they weren't prepared for residency, so we studied it. We asked them, and PGY1s and 2s told us that about half of them didn't feel prepared for residency. And then we started to dig into that a little bit more, and one of the things they articulated was that they weren't taking call. And so when they got to, uh, when they got to residency, they were surprised about what it was like. And some of them said, if I knew it was gonna be like this, I would have picked a different specialty. And we thought that was strange. What does that mean that you're not taking call? So we surveyed them and we asked them. And about half of them in their clerkship took two or fewer calls. Same thing on their sub -I. In fact, some took no call. So they didn't get to see what it was like to be a, a resident. And then if you look at what that does, the less prepared you are, the less call you take, the less prepared you are, and the more likely you are to have burnout. So by responding to this, we've actually probably adversely hurt the residents. We know that there are a lot of benefits to call, and what we heard was that they could self-select. What I said earlier, they could choose, if they saw a call and didn't want to do that, they could go into an easier specialty. I mean, a different specialty, but. Uh, it's being live streamed, so I gotta be careful. Uh, anyway, so, it, so how did this happen? So it turns out there's a survey that the medical students fill out every year to tell this institution what they liked, what they didn't like, how the experience was about being a medical student there. And then the dean gets that report, goes to the vice dean, and we've talked to lots of deans and vice deans about this process. And then it goes down to the clerkship director and chair and it says, look, the medical students don't want to take call. They don't like it, they didn't find it valuable. And so what happens? They don't take call and they're all happy, right? So, but what's happened here? So in this book, The Coddling of the American Mind, uh, which has some good points and some bad points, but this point I thought was really interesting. They are trying to understand why college students are starting to shout and call out uh, any uh, ideas or concepts or speakers who have a different opinion than their own and are trying to block them from campuses. It's one of their central tenets here. And they note that on the first day of college on orientation, probably for residency in the workforce, people are taught to identify mistreatment and report it, and that is good. We want that, we need that, we, had it, we didn't have it for a long time, we have it now. But that starts to trickle down to people reporting things or calling things out or complaining when they're just uncomfortable. And some of that is good, but some of that could be a problem as well. We in college or in residency maybe do want some things that are uncomfortable and want them to learn in a protected environment so they, they, can, they can figure those things out there. So call, call might make them uncomfortable. But call might, really probably something that, is, uh, that they disagreed with. And this trickles down even further than their spillover. And now they complain about anything that they just disagree with. And so res or medical students complained about call, we overreacted and responded, and then we've hurt their well-being. And this is not meant to be patronizing. This is actually the fact that we have some perspective and we should prepare them for the road ahead and be cautious. We should certainly hear them out, but we have to be cautious. And so our good intentions sometimes do get in the way if taken too far. So what can we do? A couple practical things that probably seem obvious to you, but I, I needed to sort of put it together and internalize it. So first, we have to embrace change. This is just gonna keep happening. We're gonna keep changing, and so are the trainees that come out. And it's not a generational thing. I hope, you under, I hope I've convinced you of that. Uh, but if I haven't, just wait till iGen comes along with their heart-shaped glasses and ice cream cones, and they've never known a world without iPhones and Twitter. Um, and so they'll be coming medical students soon. And so we're just gonna have to adapt our lifelong pr learning principles to this. Again, this seems obvious, right? appreciate, respect, enjoy our trainees. They were, they're us just a few years ago. 
And I am guilty of this, so I'm always moving way too fast. This takes some intentionality to slow down and think about the trainees and create opportunities. I will tell you, one of my best parts of the day is just walking into uh, the resident pen, which is just outside my office of all the resident research fellows, and just kind of chatting, getting the latest gossip, whatever. But it's fun to see them and talk with them, and I think, again, just slowing down to be able to do this. I think we all realize that yelling and screaming to convey a point is that should just be over. There, there's not a, a need for it. We have to teach them. We can still hold them accountable. And Dave Hoyt said this really well to me a few weeks ago. He said, it's okay to dis express disappointment and dissect a bad decision by a resident or call out their carelessness or just not taking good enough care of the patients so you can make them understand the weight of that failure. But you just can't do it with yelling and profanity. And you certainly can't do it with physical intimidation. It just isn't right. It just doesn't work teach them. And Dr. Hoyt's pretty old school, and so I think this means a lot coming from him, and, uh, and I think that um, we can all figure out how to do this. It's okay to be well. So this is a paper that came out in JAMA surgery just a couple weeks ago, where they asked retired surgeons, what would you have done differently? Look at those top two. They would spend more time with their family and on wellness, and they would have joined a less stressful practice environment. So our seniors are telling us, hang on a second, take a little more time, it's okay to think about wellness. And it's okay for me to talk about wellness. This took me a long time. I procrastinated, which is not usually my style. I procrastinated a ton on picking a topic for this. I didn't want you to think I was talking about wellness and I was weak or not old school enough. Actually, I was told by Nat Soper that recently that I'm a little too old school still, but this makes me seem pretty woke, doesn't it? So. Uh... <laughs> But hopefully I'll take my own lessons next time. In 2015, I had pneumonia, white count of 32,000. I still tried to do seven cases and was found down in my office. That's not, we, we gotta move past that. We heard, we've heard stories like that, Taylor's story. You know, lots of stories, we gotta move past them. The other thing we have to do is model and teach seemingly conflicting behavior. How do we show excellence, unparalleled patient care, but yet also make it so we can get to see our families on time travel with them. I don't explicitly tell trainees what I do to set all of that up. What do I do to make sure I get out when there's a soccer game? What do I do when I'm traveling? And I think this is just like anything else in residency. We have to explicitly teach this. Um, and if we don't do it now for them, they will suffer and they won't have this wellness when they get done or they'll have to work extra hard to do this. And I know some of you are looking at this. Yeah, Layla's tooth, loose tooth, is connected to a stomp rocket. We rocketed that sucker out. It worked really well. We have to give feedback and mentorship. We, ha we can't be afraid that what we're gonna say is gonna get twisted, misunderstood, or we're gonna get some adverse repercussion from it. It has to be good feedback and constructive feedback, and institutions have to allow us to do this. We can't have fear of this. Let me show you one quick example where I got in trouble for this recently, sort of. Uh, one of my trainees, mentees, came to me and said, you know, I'm thinking about writing an NIH R01 grant, and it'll be about, it's due about four or five weeks after the baby comes. I said, what are you talking about? That's crazy. Don't do that. You can't do that. It's gonna be too hard, and you should enjoy the peanut. The peanut's only a peanut for so long. Enjoy that special time. And so the person agreed with me, left, and then somebody else came into my office and said, I'm sorry, I overheard what you were saying, and I was really offended. It's not your business to tell a woman when and whether she can or cannot write an R01 when she's just had a baby. And I said, uh, okay, I, I can understand that. I thought I was just giving good mentoring advice. And I was giving it to Dave O'Dell, who wasn't a woman, but I would have given that advice to a woman. And so I think that it's okay to give that advice and try to protect our people and trying to help them to be well. Um, and this comes to the principle of charity. Can we give each other the benefit of the doubt? This book spends a lot of time on this, thinking about how can we sort of improve our well-being, improve how we react to each other, interpret things in their most generous, beneficial way first. And don't just to call out everything that we don't agree with. Go that extra step. I think we would all agree, certainly that the trainees that we work with are not dumb, lazy, or malicious. If you do, that's a problem. We think they're smart, hardworking, well-intentioned. And so if we try to understand them, just go that one step further, give them the benefit of the doubt, we might learn something. 
Jen Walji wrote this great piece. It was a JAMA piece of my mind. And she started with a beautiful narrative. And it was an attending with the medical student at the scrub sink. And the attending is scrubbing in, and the medical student is working furiously on the phone, not looking up, just typing away. And the attending is getting annoyed. Why is this guy doing this? We're about to go into a case. And so trying to engage him, the attending asks a question and says, you know, what are the uh, structures that we're going to encounter, and what order? And the medical student very quickly rattles them off and perfectly. And then turns the phone around and says, you know, last night I was looking, and there are two ways to expose the neurovascular bundle. Which one are we going to use? So he wasn't on Facebook. Um, and we can give each other the benefit of the doubt and assume that there may be a reason for what they're doing. This is the opposite. So this is where an, a student, a trainee, misunderstood the, the faculty. You know, sometimes when we're doing the varus needle, we'll lift up and we give the abdomen a little slap to have the omentum fall away. Um, or in a high pack, you gotta shake the patient, and then you shake the patient with your hip and with backside, and I just realized that's probably on video forever. But, uh, uh, but what happened was that the medical student in both of these cases at different institutions reported the attending for abusing the patient. So again, let's interpret things in their best possible way. So we can't ignore trainee well-being. The cat's out of the bag, trains left the station, horses left the barn, whatever you wanna say. And the second trial is our approach and how we got pulled in, but our approach to how we want to improve trainee wellness um, and have well-adjusted and happy uh, and well residents. The AAS will see these new generations first. It's our job to lead the way in understanding and developing them and role modeling how to be great academic surgeons and humans. So my key takeaways as I was putting this together are that each generation has faced these issues with the next. This is not new. Societal changes may be greater than generational, and the kids are all right. We have great people coming into surgery. We shouldn't worry about that. Don't pave the road with your good intentions, meaning don't let our good intentions sometimes get in the way, and we need to be ready to embrace change and adapt. Now, for the past 20, 30 minutes, I've been talking about problems in the house of surgery, and I don't want any trainees in the room to be confused. We will figure this out. We're academic surgery, we're strong, look at this group. We have the greatest job in the world. It is by far the best job in the world. And that's why doing this work with the Association for Academic Surgery has been the honor of a lifetime. And thank you for trusting me to do this.